Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us this early Saturday morning. I hope some folks are able to attend some of the sessions yesterday. I know it was a really great lineup and we have another um, awesome lineup for this for this morning and um, this afternoon. Um, so a uh, quick introduction of myself. I'm Andy Maxwell and I'm an uh, MD-PhD student at the University of Minnesota, interested in substance use disorders during the perinatal period, um, as well as psychiatric disorders during times of physiological change. Uh, so perinatal period, menopause, puberty. Um, I'm also a, uh, on the planning committee for this conference. Um, and I'm very excited to moderate this 50 minute panel called Women and Addiction, the Role of Gender, Pregnancy and Parenting on Substance Use with our three excellent panelists. Um, I'm just gonna give a brief introduction of each of our panelists, a quick nod to our sponsors, and then we will dive right in. Uh, so by way of introduction, um, Dr. Andre Jones is a professor in the Department of OBGYN at, at UNC Chapel Hill and a licensed psychologist. She is also the executive, executive director of UNC Horizons, which is a comprehensive drug treatment program for pregnant and parenting women and their children. Dr. Jones is an internationally recognized expert in the development of behavioral and pharmacologic treatments for addiction in pregnant women, and as such has co-authored two books, generated national and international guidelines for treatment, and has received continuous NIH funding to study OUD in pregnant women since 1994. Dr. Kimberly Sue is an assistant professor of medicine with a program in addiction medicine at Yale. She is the medical director of the National Harm Reduction Coalition and is on the Yale Addiction Medicine Consult Service. She trained at Harvard's MD-PhD social science program where she earned her PhD in sociocultural anthropology. Her 2019 book, um, Getting Wrecked, Women, Incarceration and the American Opioid Crisis is based on her research on women with opioid use disorder in the Massachusetts carceral system. Uh, and I read her book and I recommend it, although I'm supposed to say I personally recommend it because we cannot provide promotions through the conference, but personal recommendation, recommendation by Andy Maxwell, okay. Uh, finally, Dr. Helena Rutherford is an associate professor in the Yale Child Study Center and director of the Before and After Baby Lab, where she studies the neurobiology of parenting. She is also interested in how addiction may impact parenting and was recent, re recently awarded an R01 to study psychosocial and neurobiological stress and opioid use trajectories following pregnancy. Dr. Rutherford earned her, earned her PhD in psychology from Bangor University and completed her postdoc training at Yale School of Medicine before joining the faculty. Um, so before we get started, I just wanna acknowledge our sponsors. Um, so thank you to our sponsors, Karen Davidowicz in loving memory of Matthew, um, Yale New Haven, New Haven Health Hospital, and then JNU. So without further ado, uh, my first question for all the panelists, um, just really a, an introductory question about, I'm curious in how you guys became interested in studying addiction or addiction in women, what kind of career path or um, how that came about. So I'm just gonna start based off of who pops up first on my screen. So Dr. Rutherford, you're first. Thanks, Andy. Good morning, everybody. Um, so I really started in this area for my postdoc training. So when I was in the UK, I did my PhD in experimental psychology, uh, and I was really interested in how we pay attention to emotionally relevant information and motivationally relevant information. So I did a lot of research studies just with college students looking at how they attend to emotionally relevant information. So photographs of angry facial expressions or happy facial expressions. Uh, we used to condition visual objects with monetary losses or monetary gains. Um, and we used to look at threat relevant stimuli, so showing college students photographs of spiders um, just to see how they would attend and, and process um, information that's, that's really relevant for them. Um, and so, I was really interested in these basic mechanisms of motivation and motivational processing, um, but really wanted to move into more of an applied setting and think about how that impacts our understanding of, of development more broadly. Um, and so I came to the Child Study Center to do my postdoc with Dr. Linda Mays, um, and she was interested in studying motivational processes in mothers with substance use disorders. Um, and it was a really great match that, you know, I had this mechanistic interest, she was working in this applied area. Um, and so we really, you know, 
forged forward in terms of experimental design and, and recruiting and working with women with substance use disorders. And it really grew from there, uh, really starting to have an appreciation of not only the motivational mechanisms, but also how we can contextualize that in the lived in experience of these women with substance use disorders as well. Um, so very fortunate that you know, my path was from this very rigorous experimental training into a much more applied setting where um, I'm moving forward in that way. Great, thank you. I, I think my the my advisor I work with right now also used to do um, fear response to spiders. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Spider phobia seems to be a common uh, area of origin. Um, uh, Dr. Jones. Uh, so I have a similar and very different path um, as Dr. Rutherford. So my name is Dr. Andre Jones and uh, my uh, love and passion and compassion for pregnant and parenting individuals that are using substances started with my mom in the sense that she um, had a classroom. She was a special education teacher and she had a classroom that I would go into and I got to know the children very well. And one of them had my exact same birthday and she had full-blown fetal alcohol syndrome. And I remember looking at this child who was nine at the time um, and thinking, wow, like, why would moms drink? Um, wow, I'm really glad my mom didn't drink because I would be like that child. And then like, wow, what could we do to help moms not drink? And what could we do to help the children if moms can't stop drinking? And I knew I didn't want to be a physician. I don't like blood, Dr. Sue. So <laughs> there was no way I was going to be doing that. But I loved brain and behavior. And so I uh, got my PhD in experimental psychology, did uh, develop the first animal model of prenatal exposure to abused inhalants. The only model we had in 1994 was um, a, an occupational low level uh, exposure model. And so I changed the model based on what we were seeing clinically and created this model where we found that inhalant, prenatal inhalant abuse leads to very similar effects that we see with prenatal alcohol exposure. But I knew that I didn't want to do the animal research. I appreciated it has its place, but it wasn't my calling. I wanted to do something that was gonna give back and make a practical difference immediately. And so I had the opportunity to get a clinical internship in a perinatal 20 program, which at the time for history's sake, uh, both SAMHSA and the National Institute on Drug Abuse funded 20 different programs around the United States focused on a treatment for prenatal cocaine exposure for parents. It was a dyadic mm -hmm. model. And so from there, I went and did a postdoctoral fellowship at Johns Hopkins University, and then they hired me as faculty, and that started my career trajectory, really looking at how to create both behavioral and medication interventions to help improve outcomes of pregnant and post-pregnant post and parenting individuals and their children. Thank you for that. Yeah, I find that starting a lot of people start with animal models and then decide they don't like that. And then so switch to humans. I had I used to study sex differences and PTSD in animals. And then I was like, well, I really hate attacking all these animals. I don't want to do this anymore. Um, and then so switch to humans. Um, thank you. Um, Dr. Sue. Um, I, I'm glad I get to go last because I think I have the most uh, unique path to, to where I am right now. Um, you know, I really started and was interested in addiction generally as um, through through AIDS activism and uh, really saw, I was like, how do you become like a, you know, how can we, you know, leverage, you know, our resources and wealth for people experiencing structural violence? And so that was a question that I approached intellectually as an anthropologist, sort of, and, and as a, as a, you know, college student, um, uh, sort of in, in solidarity. So I really saw the, the, the work that I did and have always done as, as really being a way to leverage policy, you know, <laughs> really trying to work at those levers. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as an, as a sociocultural anthropologist, I was just like addiction, especially, you know, addiction generally is just incredibly complex and every patient, every person's story is individual. Every substance they choose, the combination of substances they choose, where they use, why they use, um, it's, just, it's just fascinating. I could talk about it all the time. I could, you know, with, <laughs> with my patients, I talk about it all the time. 
And, and so clinically, it's an interesting and compelling and very rewarding place to be. Um, and, and, you know, working with people, you know, but, but at the same time, you know, it, it's very frustrating to be a clinician and see all of these downstream problems and, and, and not be able to, you know, understand really why those are happening, you know, so the, the research becomes important and thinking about how to translate that into action. So it's wonderful to be um, on a panel with people doing that uh, as well. So we can chat about that. Thank you. Um, so our, my first question um, just revolves around this, the kind of general theme about substance use disorders and pregnant and parenting women in general. So I think some folks may not be kind of familiar with the current state of substance use disorder treatments or presentation. Um, so Dr. Jones, for some of the non-clinicians in the audience, could you provide a brief overview of some of the key treatment approaches that we recommend for pregnant women with OUD, or maybe perhaps how they present differently than non-pregnant people with, with OUD? Yeah, sure. So I think one of the really important things to remember is that pregnancy is a period in time. And so it's not as if uh, magically someone starts using uh, a substance just because they've become pregnant. So the, there are a few exceptions to that, um, but the vast, vast majority of people are already using substances and then become pregnant and then will not be pregnant, right? So um, it's really important for us to rep recognize that just because someone is using a substance, one, they might not have a substance use disorder. There's a whole continuum. There is use and mild, moderate, severe use disorders. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to treat everybody the same way. Oftentimes I'll hear, oh, if they're pregnant, they need residential treatment. Yes, for some people, but not for everybody. Um, so the other important thing to think about is that um, we need to understand the role that the substance is playing in that person's life and meet them where they are. Um, because they become pregnant, there is a tremendous amount of pressure and guilt and stigma and added shame um, for someone who is using a substance. And so we need to take great care with that to listen with our ears, our eyes, and our heart. We need to take care with the language that we use to make sure we are using strength-based language, recovery first, person first language. Um, and that we also don't want to treat that substance use disorder in isolation. So uh, we want to make sure we have integrated care. For example, at Horizons, we have a prenatal care program where the pregnant person comes in and sees a counselor, sees a case manager, and then sees the provider where they might get buprenorphine, for example, or naltrexone, um, or be prescribed methadone from a methadone clinic. So integrated care is a must to have um, good outcomes. And the other important thing to remember is even if someone doesn't stop using, as long as we can get them to come back and keep that conversation going, make sure that they're getting prenatal vitamins, doing all of those other behaviors um, in prenatal care, then we know that we can have a much greater opportunity to have positive birth outcomes for that pregnant person as well as for the baby. Other things that are important to think about with treatment, a dialectical behavioral therapy, if you have not heard of that, it is by far my patient's most preferred and liked um, intervention. One of the patients I had said, you know, Dr. Jones, I came in, when I came in, I had a pocket full of pills. I'm leaving with a pocket full of DBT skills. And I just loved that. So what is DBT? Uh, it is living in the present moment, being grounded, which is so helpful for individuals who have had traumatic experiences. It's a, learning how to regulate emotions and ride with those emotions. It's um, being able to understand relationships and improve relationship with self, relationships with others, and perhaps relationships with higher powers. Um, and I think the other thing I'll end with is we need to make sure that as part of that care, we are addressing, you know, social determinants of health or what I like to think of as um, health related social issues. So that we are addressing housing, transportation, and the violence. And I will stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Do you find that um, pregnancy is a really, I mean, do, do more people who otherwise may not have sought treatment kind of come to you when they find out they're pregnant or? Yeah, yeah so it can be a really important um, time in a person's life to say, oh, wow, I'm, you know, thinking about myself and thinking about my fetus and yeah. I want to make those behavioral changes. So it can be a motivator. We just have to be really careful that we don't um, inadvertently, unintentionally 
uh, create more guilt, shame, and stigma yeah. because there's mm-hmm. pressure put on somebody because magically they're pregnant, everything's going to change. So yeah, yeah, it's a balance. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Sue, I know you're very active in the harm reduction field. Could you tell us a little bit about what harm reduction is and also um, some of the challenges and successes, you, successes you've encountered in trying to bring harm reduction to you know, general health policy, but also women or pregnant women in general? Of course. Um, and I also was just having a conversation about DBT at 8.30 this morning. So I was, you know, <laughs> telling some of my friends who are doctors about the DBT that I do in primary care at the methadone clinic. And I was like, oh. I'm doing DBT. They're like, oh, I want to learn DBT too. I'm like, well, you have to really just, you have to just learn it, I'll pick it up and you can, you know, basically do it. Um, so um, shout out to DBT. But um, yeah, so harm reduction is, um, is both a philosophy and a practice that really tries to minimize um, negative effects from substance use um, and, and, and the war on drugs, really. We're like, we're trying to frame it out to be like, this is not just about individual behaviors, but actually about racialized drug policy um, and bringing, bringing, looking at some of those forces that we know, those structures that we know impact, um, you know, the way in which people are able to thrive and flourish um, and that prohibit them from doing so. So um, generally, many of the policies that we put forth are access to syringe service programs, access to um, naloxone. Uh, we, now in this country, we have um, a couple above board overdose prevention centers where people can use um, pre-obtained substances and, and not die. Um, we think about housing first programs, which don't condition uh, that you have to be um, sober uh, to, to, to have housing. Um, and, um, and, you know, even just places like drop-in centers or low barrier access to medication, uh, medication-based treatments. So all of those we think about as um, in the umbrella of harm reduction. Uh, Joe Biden said harm reduction for the first time in the State of the Union, which, you know, we really lauded that. Um, and uh, it is undergoing a lot of changes as, as it is scaling up, you know. Um, and so uh, so for women in particular, though, you know, there's this added level of shame and stigma that Dr. Jones was talking about. Um, you know, I'll tell a story which we were developing a pregnancy substance use toolkit for Harm Reduction Coalition a couple years ago. And one of the um, one of the people at the AIDS Institute, um, at the Office of Drug User Health, um, who he basically said, you know, when we were developed, we were just brainstorming. He was like, you know, I saw like a pregnant person, like, a pregnant woman, like drinking a coffee in the soup in the in the line in the supermarket. And he really just wanted to like rip it out of her hand. And I'm like, imagine if you're injecting drugs and you're pregnant, you know, and like that kind of like if, if someone feels that, you know, we have people have so many feelings about substance, you know, such as coffee, right? Illicit, you know, like, a, you know, I mean, it's, a, you know, illicit beverage, you know, with, you know, containing a, a substance. And, and so, you know, imagine if, if it's a criminalized substance and, and the ways in which if you have track marks or, or things like that and, and, the, and the, sh- the stigma and the shame and the secret, secrecy that people have to go through, um, you know, and, and I meet many patients, but there are many more who would rather, I get emails from around the country that say, I'd rather die than go to the ER. I have this black thing growing on my breast. My kids are my life. I live in some state in the Midwest or the South and I'm not going to go in, you know, so, so like that it's, it's honestly, you know, it's horrifying. Right. And that, and that is to, that is to speak more broadly to, you know, how individuals make decisions in these contexts of criminalization. So that's what some of, a lot of my research and areas of interest lie. And I think it's hard for us not to, uh, not to reckon with the fact that people are trying to do the best that they can, um, uh, you know, and, and really are struggling. Uh, they, they wanna be well, they want to be healthy, um, but there's, there's a lot of forces, uh, social forces at play that, that are, um, that we, you know, that we, um, our society contributes to. And then there's a lot of, you know, a lot of ways that we, um, so hearing about horizons obviously is, is going to be, you know, it's really important and holding up models like that as we move forward. We have a question from the chat. So you had mentioned a little bit about providing easy access to treatment. Um, the question is, how do you think we can tackle the Narcan shortage right now? Or in the future, yeah. the current Narcan shortage. 
That's a great question. Um, so, um, so there's a there's a current shortage um, of naloxone. Um, the panelist is asking about that, um, and and that that has been going on for months, if not um, some some years um, during COVID, there was thought to be like, you know, a supply crisis. Um, some of the big makers of, of naloxone were having difficulty getting it out. Um, it is it is a currently, I think uh, the way to tackle it is really just making sure that the naloxone is distributed to people who are act, uh, who are most likely to use it, who are people who are actively using drugs, their family and friends. Um, we have a lot of naloxone that is sitting in I've done trainings for district attorneys, uh, you know, I've, I've done trainings for, you know, even, you know, we say everyone should carry naloxone, but it's sort of not true that like everyone's going to encounter someone that they need to give naloxone to, right? So, so it's really, I used to say like, oh, like a couple of years ago, I used to be like, it's fine. Everyone wants to get, you know, it's good that we raise awareness of naloxone and everyone should have it. But also it's not necessarily true. A number of times I've walked through New York City where I have actually administered naloxone, I could count, you know, is, is one maybe, you know, and even once I get there and assess someone, I realize that they actually don't need it, right? Um, and and so, so currently taking it out of places like public health departments, maybe that aren't actually distributing them, getting them to harm reduction programs, funneling them, uh, where they're at risk of expiring um, uh, really is, is important um, and getting them to scrappy on the ground harm reduction programs until we can. We also need um, some uh, to to, de to take out the, um, you know, the, uh, the the prescription requirement, which which is a whole nother thing that's been going on at the FDA for about several several years. So that's like a, a whole separate panel. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for your thoughts, um, Dr. Rutherford. So we just talked a little bit about the the clinical presentation. Could you give us a brief overview of what we know or what your work has shown so far about changes in brain function um, around the, po the perinatal period and if and how these process processes are affected by substance use disorders? Yes, absolutely. So we've been working in this area for a number of years now, thinking about the neurobiology of parenting generally, and then also how that those neural mechanisms are affected by addiction. And I think to, to pivot of off of what Dr. Jones said, that many of the women that we see in our research studies have a substance use disorder first and then become pregnant subsequently. And so that's the, the directionality that we've been thinking about a lot in our research, that we, we very rarely see the, the opposite situation that a, a, an individual becomes pregnant um, and then starts using substances. And so with that in mind, what we've been trying to do is to get a better understanding of the areas of the brain that are important for parenting. Um, and so we use different neuroimaging techniques to understand brain structure and brain function. In more general terms, we know that there's a lot of plasticity of the brain during the perinatal period. And I think that that's why it's a ripe time for thinking about interventions, that we can take advantage of the changing biology to try and leverage our understanding of these mechanisms to really support women uh, during this period. So we know that there's a lot of change, um, particularly in terms of areas of the brain that are important to parenting and, and social cognition more generally. So how we pay attention towards signals that are given by infants, uh, how we focus our attention towards their needs, you know, almost as a cost of, of everything else that's happening around us. Um, and so there's some of those key brain areas that areas that are involved in reward and, and how we process what's positive or, or um, emotionally happy for us. And so thinking about infants, you can just imagine a smiling baby face you don't have to be a parent to have a, a rewarding or pleasurable response um, to a smiling infant face. But more generally, we know that even when infants are crying, the parts of the brain that are involved in how we process reward are also activated. Um, so that's that piece around motivation I talked about earlier, that there's a motivation towards approaching that infant because they need something. They're, they're communicating that they're, they're in distress um, and it cues parents as well as non-parents into to caring for them. So we spend a lot of time thinking about how we process reward in parenting, but then also we think a lot about stress in parenting too. And um, you don't need to have a substance use disorder to know that parenting can be pretty stressful, um, especially in the early months when infants can't communicate what they need. Um, and so you're really trying to understand that. But then as those infants become toddlers and toddlers become children, adolescents, that stress just changes. It's always there. Um, and having a more open conversation around stress in parenting is really important. 
And so we think about reward and stress, neural circuits as being critical to parenting behavior, but we also know that those neural circuits are those that are aberrant in addiction to, that if we study individuals with substance use disorders, um, that we see dysregulation of these stress neural circuits, but also more general dampening of reward responses to what would otherwise be very salient or very motivationally relevant information in that way. Mm. And so it really gives us a lens to think about neurobiological mechanisms to understand how addiction might be affecting parenting, that we can look at these key neural circuits that we know are important to parenting, but are also compromised in the presence of substance use disorders. So what we try and do then is to, to leverage that understanding to think about experimental research that we can do to, to really pinpoint what is it exactly about parenting stress um, or what is it about that reward response that really then lends itself to, to where mothers do struggle with caring for their children in the presence of substance use disorders. Um, and just to highlight that not all mothers with substance use disorders struggle in their caregiving role. Many are able to have the most beautiful relationships with their children um, and then you know, many do struggle. And so the what we're trying to understand is where that line is, where understanding where we can identify risk based on these mechanisms and where we can use that knowledge then to leverage um, refinement and advancement of different intervention approaches too. Um, so we do a lot of work with women postnatally um, and we're also now doing work with women prenatally to see where some of those neural mechanisms um, may be showing your know, potential risk related to caregiving but also broader substance use um, as well so that's what we're trying to to, to focus our, our efforts on in that way and you have a historically used EEG uh, right and but uh, I saw your current study uses fMRI is that correct yeah. okay so how have you okay I don't this is just the nerd in me asking mm -hmm. so Sorry for the attendees. Um, but so how have you found the difference between EEG and MRI when working around this time period? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. And we use those techniques for different reasons. Um, so EEG is really um, a technique that we can use when we want to understand more about very rapid neural processes. Um, okay. So it doesn't really tell us where in the brain something's happening it's just telling us when in time it's happening and so it's a, a technique where we place sensors on the scalp and we can just measure um, cortical activity um, through those sensors um, and so what we're doing in those types of studies is we're looking at how quickly mothers are responding to photographs of infant faces or listening to, to infant cries um, and what we're seeing in those types of studies is temporal differences in how these women are responding in the presence of substance use and so what we saw in our initial work um, is that mothers with substance use disorders have a slower response to seeing an infant face compared to mothers without a substance use disorder. Um, so we were using that very categorical distinction of present versus absent. Um, Catherine Wall, who's a, a PhD student in my lab at the moment, is now advancing that effort to look at continuous measures of substance use. So you're kind of resonating with what Dr. Jones was speaking about, that we, you know, we don't, we want to move away from this categorical idea um, mm -hmm. and how we think about substance use. And, and what we're showing is, is comparable, that we're seeing that the um, more frequently women are using substances postnatally, the slower their neural responses are to these infant faces. So mm -hmm. that's why EEG gives us that time information so we can think about well what is you know what is causing that slowing how can we understand that slowing and then how does that translate to parenting the fMRI pieces is, is much more different in terms of thinking about well where might that, that those neural processes be unfolding um, and so we use an MRI scanner um, that you would find in a hospital um, and so we we do our research um, studies either in hospital settings or in medical settings where we have access to MRI and so what we're doing there is very similar in terms of experiments we're showing again infant faces or having parents listen to infant cries and looking at where in the brain is responsive to those stimuli but also how responsive um, and I think we tend to see two patterns of results. So on the one hand, we see that that decrease, that less reward response um, to infant faces and cries in mothers with substance use disorders. But what we see more recently as well is a hyper or an increased response to areas um, in the brain responsible for stress and stress dysregulation and the presence of some of those infant signals too. Um, so we're really trying to, to change the way that we've thought about this that's traditionally been all about reward responses and decreased responses to also be thinking about increased hyper reactive responses where these mothers are, are finding that it's stressful um, seeing signals of infant emotion too. Does that help Andy? Yes, very interesting. There was a, a talk yesterday about OCD during the perinatal time period, and they talked a lot about this hypersensitivity to um, infant, you know, infant distress signals. So I'm just, yeah, curious to see what, understand what that overlap is between motivation and reward and compulsion. 
Um, so we talked a little bit, uh, we've kind of talked around the Horizons program a little bit. Um, Dr. Jones, I'm wondering if you could um, kind of for our attendees, describe what it is and, and your role and, and how it serves the women in your community. Sure, thank you so much for that question. Uh, so I'm the executive director for UNC Horizons and also lead a lot at leader research. We have a bunch of studies looking at uh, various like naltrexone, the relative safety and efficacy for naltrexone during pregnancy in the immediate postpartum period uh, for both alcohol use disorder as well as opioid use disorder is just one example and I will spare you the rest of them. Uh, so the Horizons model was started in 1993 uh, it started in one OBGYN clinic where uh, the OB that was working there said that he was seeing a lot of patients that had prenatal cocaine use and he wanted to do more um, to help. So he hired a case manager and that started the model of integrated care. And it really expanded from there. We've uh, worked with both SAMHSA as well as the state of North Carolina to receive block grant funding. Uh, so we're really lucky in the state of North Carolina where 10% of all of our block grant funding is set aside for women and children's services. So we received some of that those funds that we have today a whole continuum of care. So our really lowest level of care that we have is that prenatal care clinic that I talked about, uh, where we see uh, pregnant people every two weeks. So usually the traditional OB model is that you see the, the provider less frequently in the early stages, and then you kind of ramp up um, intensity of uh, being seen as pregnancy advances, but that's not us um, because our patients need us all throughout their pregnancy because we're not just dealing with physical health. We'll also deal with social determinants as well as um, behavioral health. So every, every two weeks, even well into the postpartum period. And now that Medicaid has expanded to 12 months, finally in the state of North Carolina, we get to see them every two weeks for the whole year after they've had their baby. We now, the newest thing we've also added is a uh, pediatric care so that um, we've got a much better model where we can have dyadic care where the pediatrician can see the child and see the birthing parent. Mm -hmm. um, the most intensive part that we have are, is residential treatment. And so we're very fortunate where um, we, uh, parents can bring their children with them into treatment. Um, so then parents can stay there for an average of nine months. Uh, you do need to identify as a woman be, based on the way that the service definitions are written. Um, so uh, that is one thing to know. And uh, in terms of while they're there, we have a five-star licensed daycare or childcare facility where the children, all, all of them get screened and assessed. We don't wanna wait for developmental delays. We go ahead and look as soon and start to provide intervention services if they're needed. Not all children need them, but if they do need them, we are there with different types of occupational um, speech language uh, movement types of therapies, cognitive help if needed, but not all of them need it. Um, for the birthing parent, uh, we, half of the women that come in are pregnant, the other half are parenting. Um, and so for those individuals, everybody gets a case manager, everybody gets a therapist, they can see our psychiatrist. Uh, we have a legal scholar who helps provide legal aid services. We take patients to court if they need it. They can obviously receive medication to treat opioid use disorder or alcohol use disorder. Uh, let's, we have peer support specialty. I think that that is such a wonderful service to have people that have graduated from our program that have not needed us for two years. We encourage them to come back and work with us so that they can be the model of recovery. Uh, we provide naloxone, of course. Uh, and so uh, we have 11 different evidence-based practices. So um, patients will be attending group treatment as well as individual therapy. I'm sure I've left something out, but that gives you a good sense of what we do. <laughs> How many residents do you usually have at, at a given time in the residential program? Yeah, so um, we can serve up to 40 individuals. Um, um, so like right now, I think we have 30 individuals with us and, and that's, that means that's 30 adults. Um, yeah. And as I said, we have pregnant and parenting people. So at any given time, you know, we could literally have 50 children. <laughs> so 
Have there been people trying to kind of replicate that model in other states or other parts of North Carolina? Yeah. So, um, you know, one of the things that's really important um, is that if you've seen Medicaid in one state, you've seen Medicaid in one state. So how do you, uh, you know, how does that get, how does our model get translated into other places? Um, so we've expanded, we've uh, helped consult uh, in New Hampshire with uh, their outpatient model and they've started residential services. Uh, the state of West Virginia, we've been working with in terms of their outpatient models of care. Uh, in terms of Alaska, we've helped there, um, again, with outpatient levels of care. Everybody, I think, uh, ideally, everybody wants that residential level of care because it is the most intensive part of our continuum. I forgot to talk about after uh, our continuing care services. So the other piece is when patients um, complete our services in residence, they can continue to be outpatient or just regular outpatient. And we have an alumna group that meets every two weeks um, that just kind of keeps people connected because connection is so important. And if there is a return to substance use, we can more easily get them the care that they need. Um, so where else? Uh, Kansas, Missouri, it's in, even internationally, people have come to look at our model. I don't know of any place that has been able to do exactly what we do with all of those levels of care, uh, but definitely pieces of the model have um, been taken and are working. Great, thank you. So kind of playing off that, Dr. Sue, uh, what do you think needs to happen at the policy level that could improve the accessibility of these kinds of services for women? Um, or you know, also for women following incarceration to kind of continue to be involved in their children's lives. I mean, that is a you know, <laughs> that are like, that's like fifty dissertations. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, there's there's it's just hard to know exactly where to start. I mean, um, medication for opioid use disorder um, is is the gold. You know, medication is the gold standard. Um, and, and really we know that, that pregnancy is a, a we, you know, we are conceptualizing of opioid use disorder as a, a we conceptualize it as a chronic uh, condition, you know, that, um, that people often will need to be on medication um, for, you know, on and off, but for long periods of time and or possibly their entire life um, to live and thrive. And, um, and so we still, uh, you know, we still operate in a place generally where, you know, people don't have access to medication, let alone um, uh, pre pregnant people. Um, and so uh, it, that would be, that would be one thing, you know, um, Carolyn Suffren and OBGYN at Hopkins did a study that looked at rates of um, medication for opioid use disorder in among, among pregnant people, uh, pregnant people. She surveyed, I think 20 state prisons and six County jails and saw that you know a third of the the, the people who were pregnant um, had to go through withdrawal, which really you know we really you know it's really not medically recommended, um, and um, and let alone where they started on agonist on on therapy on agonist therapy or discharge on agonist therapy, and those transitions are very high risk generally. Um, so when anytime you disrupt where someone is and, and they go inside and then they come back out, those are very high risk transitions in terms of addiction and opioid use or substance use trajectories generally. Um, and that can also include, you know, going to treatment, you know, going to detox, going to a program, coming out of a program, people die. They say she was just in a program and then, you know, and then she come, you know, so, so we actually did have, you know, that, that actually, you know, we did have a, you know, a case that was that was heartbreaking of, of a of a postpartum patient that died that way and 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 um, that has to do with the med Medicaid expansion, as Dr. Jones said, would allow us to know that fourth trimester period where you are in the most stressful period of your life. Substances are all you've ever known to cope, and you're supposed to and your in your and your methadone is tapered off because you're done with your pregnancy and your Medicaid's out. Mm -hmm. You know, and so that's very common. So even things like Medicaid expansion on a policy level would improve pregnancy, you know, and substance use outcomes for sure. You know, um, uh, overdose is one of the one of the you know big major causes of, um, and as well as mental health conditions are the, some of the big major causes of of um, you know uh, peripartum mortality, right, um, and postpartum mortality. So. Um, so thinking about the dyad, thinking about families, um, thinking about those those conditions um, is is really important. Obviously, housing is 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 really important. Housing first programs. Um, there's just never enough 
uh, you know, quote unquote beds. You know, Dr. Jones was saying like everyone's trying to improve their outpatient model, but no one wants to like, you know, there's, you know, and, and, and we can improve all of those levels of services, but there's also not enough places where people need to go in there in crisis. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, just expanding even things like accessing methadone, for example, if we could, if, if, um, the stigma of bringing your child to a methadone clinic, um, having to have childcare when you have to go get daily dose for methadone, it discourages people from being on their life-saving medication. So there's a bill in Congress that would say, you know, people could get methadone at the pharmacy, like any other regular medication that would be game changing for pregnant people and, and, and parenting, um, people with opioid use disorder. So just, just a couple <laughs> ways we can think about, um, how locked up our, <coughs> our medications are and, and ways that our policies really could, um, you know, the methadone regulations haven't changed in decades and they haven't, they haven't changed to reflect the deadlier, deadlier supply of, of, of street, street opioids, fentanyl, uh, which, which, is, which is widely prevalent across most of, most of the country. And mm -hmm. so we haven't really kept up. And that in that, in that, in that context, the overdose death rates they just they're, they just won't ever they're not coming down until we can flex some of flex some of these policies. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, a lot to chew on. It's hard to know which which challenge to focus on. Um, we do have a really good question from the audience. Um, so the question is: I'm wondering if the panelists have thoughts about how pregnancy influences the process of craving and substance use disorders. Um, and has anybody compared responses to drug and non-drug rewards, including social rewards? Um, so I, anybody can speak up <laughs> about that. So I'm happy to start and then others feel free to, to add. Um, so in our current studies, we are looking at um, craving in response to different types of, of parenting stresses during pregnancy in the postpartum period. Um, so a couple of examples of that is that we have mothers watching a video of an infant crying and we're measuring craving as well as their general mood states pre and post. Um, and another method we use is using an infant simulator. So it's a, a lifelike baby doll that is computer controlled to cry on demand. Um, and we look to see how mothers respond to that crying and, and the crying is very lifelike. So it's not just a dog crying for, for five or 10 minutes, that the cry increases and decreases its, in its intensity. So we're trying to model in pregnancy, the experience of cry associated stress and how it may be impacting craving. Um, so we're, we're looking at that. We haven't compared it to a non-parenting stress in this particular study. Um, where we have done that is where we've looked at stress related to parenting and, and non-parenting types of stresses are related to occupation or um, finances or housing um, and looking at the impact of craving that way. And we have some very preliminary data that suggests parenting stress increases craving more um, than non than sources of stress unrelated to parenting. Um, so we really need to, to bring in that that craving piece because I think it's, it's really important not only um, in terms of stress generally, but also the, you know, thinking about parenting as being a, a very salient stressor um, for a lot of those families as well. Yeah, really fast. Have you thought of, or has anybody used maybe recordings of the participants own baby crying rather than, yeah, that seems like that would be very salient stimuli. Yeah, no, I think it is. And I, I think a lot of parents, um, you know, there's a lot of discussion about how you can pick out your own baby's cry. Um, and so then, you know, that just becomes a more salient cue for you as well. Um, so we look at your know, shorter bursts of cry to two second bouts of cry um, but other studies also use kind of 10 20 30 seconds of, of infant crying of, of own versus unknown um, baby cries too to look at salience differences that way as well very interesting dr jones i saw you unmute did you want to yeah i was just just to add on um just from a medication to treat opioid use disorder standpoint we know that for both methadone and for buprenorphine that we need to be talking with patients and assessing their um, their withdrawal, their craving, because we know that on average, which it doesn't represent everybody, right? But at least on average, methadone and buprenorphine doses need to be increased as pregnancy's gestation also increases. So it's just a reminder that there is that relationship that is there that's really important so that we can help keep people well. Do you find that maybe perhaps clinicians who aren't trained in providing substance use treatment or just moms who are kind of new to the experience push back on 
increasing doses doses because I sit on the like a weekly grand rounds at MGH for psychiatric um, treatment of psychiatric diseases during the perinatal period. And a lot of the issue they bring up a lot is that moms are very hesitant to increase any dosages of anything during pregnancy. And there's also kind of this misunderstanding around the community that everything needs to go down during pregnancy instead of kind of adjusting accordingly. So yeah, that's a big question. Yes, that's a huge, it is quite a challenge, um, a communication dissemination challenge. So one of the things that's super important to know is that the relationship between the dose of methadone or buprenorphine and the extent of the withdrawal that a baby may have, they are not related. And in right. fact, when we underdose people, we give people an inadequate dose of medication of methadone or buprenorphine, they're more likely to have a return to illicit use, which is exactly not what we want to happen um, for the birthing parent and for the developing you know, a fetus. And um, so it's, we want to adequately dose people to the extent that they need that medication to stop craving, to stop withdrawal, to prevent return to use so that they've got the best chance to be as healthy as possible. And we also have really good tools to treat neonatal abstinence syndrome and to assess it. So um, it, that should not be the barrier and should not be the thing that prevents people from getting the type and amount of medication that they need. Thank you. Could could I mean I, all three of you talk a little bit about um, what kind of treatments or policies are available that targets that is uh, particular for the kit for children whose parents have substance use disorders, either like uh, treatment for neonatal abstinence withdrawal syndrome or um, just kind of a dyadic treatment approach. Um, I, sorry, somebody go for it. Oh, I was, I, I'm not an, I'm not a neonatal yeah. <clears throat> withdrawal or abstinence syndrome expert, but, um, you know, the, 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 you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but we really have moved to, um, uh, like, a uh, like a, a eat, sleep, console model. Um, uh, so, so, and rooming in sort of kangaroo care. Um, we, we know that, that for an infant that is, that might be undergoing a withdrawal syndrome, that, that being in the NICU or is possibly the worst, most, most overstimulating place for them to be. Um, and really being with, with the parent skin on skin, um, uh, is really important, <coughs> is really important. So at Yale, we have been doing the eat, sleep, console model for, um, for quite a long time as opposed to other scores like the Finnegan, which you might've heard of. Um, and, and really that, that prioritizes, you know, creating that, that, um, that dyadic relationship, um, um, chest feeding or breastfeeding is, is really encouraged um, and, and using pharmacotherapy if necessary. So using, um, using uh, morphine or, an, or another um, medication as, as necessary um, once that's indicated um, via the pathway. Um, and really, I think, uh, I, I'm not sure actually, I'm actually interested to hear if, if the rest of, you know, if, if that is, is being implemented across the country um, because uh, I know NAS is getting a lot of money, you know, I know NAS is on the rise and in every state and, and, it, and it's a condition that is very alarming to you know, a lot of policymakers and it's very expensive to keep an infant in the NICU getting morphine for a month, you know, and everyone's like, why is it so expensive? You know, and, and it's actually because you've, you've gone down a pathway that's expensive, you know, a, a pathway that requires NICU for a month and that's very expensive versus, um, versus rooming in. So, um, so there are, those are, you know, those are some of like the, how we do that at, at Yale. I can definitely just add on to that. I think Eat, Sleep and Console has been a monumental shift forward um, to really create a shared decision-making process for the birthing parent and the provider so that these decisions about the extent to which a baby needs medication, how long they're gonna get medication, um, is just that we can get babies out safely out of the hospital sooner and with less medication. Uh, and keeping the um, birthing parent and child together is essential. I, I uh, recently even, it, and when you think about brain development, which Dr. Rutherford is, you know, looking at uh, from early childhood, separating, there's lots of data to show that separating the stress and the brain changes that happen to children just because of that separation is pretty profound. So mm -hmm. the fact that we're now able to keep 
birthing person and child together is just is really important for that attachment because so much of what we work on in Horizons are attachment based parenting practices like circle of security, um, the attachment biobehavioral catch up are two examples child parent psychotherapy, uh, so that we can really get that child and birthing parent off on the right foot so that it becomes an upward spiral of attachment, rather than really, you know, kind of trying to cor correct a pattern that is ingrained um, earlier on. Thank you so much. So we have only about one minute left. So I'm just wondering if you each have just one kind of short key piece of advice that you have for trainees interested in pursuing addiction or perinatal medicine or research, what would that piece of advice be? Um, and I'll just start with Dr. Rutherford. Yes, I think my, my piece of advice would be to treat every client as an individual and recognize that every in every person goes through pregnancy in the postpartum period with their own history, their own story, what they're bringing um, to that parenting experience, either how they've been parented, their own prior adversities, their own prior strength and, and resilience, um, and that that's all coming together and is going to vary parent by parent. And so I think it's really important to recognize the uniqueness of, of each parent um, and be aware just how stressful parenting can be um, and, and keeping that in mind as you're working with new parents. Thank you. Um, Dr. Jones. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, you need a pretty thick skin to stay in this field. You have to be able to have to be able to persevere, to be able to have a high tolerance for frustration because of all of the policy things that Dr. Sue had mentioned. Um, you also need to have empathy and you need to be able to hold the hope and the light for a patient sometimes when they can't hold it themselves. Um, and you also need to listen with your eyes, your ears, and your heart to see the strengths, to find the strengths and articulate the strengths that every patient has back to them. Thank you. And Dr. Sue? I would just say um, value the, the expertise um, that, that our patients have um, and, and have compassion. You know, um, they've, they've been, they are so resilient, uh, unique, um, and I've learned so much from them. So be humble. Um, and really, uh, even though you might have a lot of degrees after your name, you know, you really haven't, you know, we have so much privilege, structural privilege um, to, to, to be where we are. Um, and, and so thinking about, um, you know, being humble, um, being compassionate, uh, having thick skin uh, uh, on top of that, you, cer you certainly need to do. And, uh, and, and really understanding that they've been through so much and that they do have expertise over their lives and, and they are going to do you know, what, what outside of my office, they are going to enact the plan, you know what I mean? And like, they hold the keys to the kingdom. And, and so, you know, I think, you know, trying, you know, we will walk alongside them and, you know, and, and, and our doors are always open, but many doors do get, do get closed for them. So, you know, I'm the, I sort of at the advocacy pieces, I would encourage you, whatever work you do to, to do that science communication that we need to do to to advertise evidence based treatments and medications to to you know so you know that is something this new generation of trainees needs which is like and, and are hungry for which is like how do we get what we do in the clinic or in, in you know it, you know in the in the MRI machine or the scanner or you know the clinical trial like how do we publicize that and how do we change policy so i think um, the, as we, you know, we, you know, as we're becoming increasingly contentious, but how do we, how do we effectively communicate the research that we do um, so our patients can live better lives? All right, thank you, and thank you again to all three of our panelists. This was really an, an, an excellent hour. Um, I learned a lot, and I hope our attendees did as well. Thank you to all the attendees. Um, the next session is on a different link in Whova. I'm supposed to remind you to be patient if it doesn't start right away because our moderators have to start the new link after this one closes. Um, but thank you again. And I hope everybody has a lovely rest of your Saturday and um, happy spring. <laughs> All right. Bye. Thank you.